Hi, Heather. Hi, Lisa. <laughs> hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, I'm so excited. Oh, hi, Lolo. I'm sorry. She <laughs> Lolo's here. Lolo. So she's, a, she's, a, you know, she's kind of getting herself on camera to make sure she gets acknowledged yes. as well. Yes. Jack Jack is sleeping. He's crashed out. I don't know what, when he's going to show up <laughs> at some point, maybe. Yes. <laughs> well, well, thank at, you so much for being here, everyone. And thank you, Lisa. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. You, you know, I always love talking to you, Heather, and I'm just, obviously everybody here knows who you are. I, I, so I'll introduce myself and then I'll introduce you. It's always like so weird to introduce yourself, but here it goes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lisa Unger. Um, I'm the New York Times bestselling author of uh, going on 20 novels of psychological suspense. Um, my most recent, Last Girl Ghosted, just came out in October, and I am thrilled to be here with Heather Goodenkoff, who is the Edgar-nominated New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of eight of nine novels with this one, right? Um, and your debut, Heather's debut, The Weight of Silence, was an instant New York Times bestseller and was on the list for 22 weeks. Uh, Heather's critically acclaimed novels have been published in over 20 countries, and they've been included on way too many best of lists. Um, but to, to recount here, but we'll just hit, we'll just hit the highlights. Uh, seven thrillers to read this summer by The New York Times, The Ten Best Thrillers and Mysteries of 2017 by The Washington Post, a best book by NPR, a best book for the beach, of course. <laughs> Although this one might be a little bit chilly for the beach, um, by Chicago Now, and her um, her newest novel, The Overnight Guest, which is absolutely uh, riveting and such an exciting book, is just out uh, last month, just out in January. Is that all? Is that all perfect? Is that exactly right, Heather? Perfect. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. So I absolutely, I absolutely loved this book. I complete, I completely devoured it. And it made me think of something like, you know, sometimes like, um, you know, our, our lives as readers are kind of an occupational hazard of being a writer, you know, because we read so much, right. And it's stuff that we want to read and some things, you know, maybe we don't want to read or that we're reading for research. So it's nice to just kind of you know, open a book and disappear into that book as a reader, which doesn't, you know, doesn't always happen. And it definitely happened for me with this book. Um, I, I enjoyed it so much. It's so, it's so thrilling and it's such a tightly woven multiple perspective novel. Um, and every piece is so perfectly orchestrated and kind of weaves together in this really um, masterful way. And I just, I just loved every second of it. Thank you. Thanks for, thank thanks you. for writing it. Thank you so much. That means a lot. <laughs> um, so I'll just say a little bit about it and then I'm going to let you um, talk about it, of course. Um, so this is um, uh, the story of a true crime writer who, whose name is uh, Wiley Lark and she has, you know, retreated to an isolated cabin um, to finish her book. And of course, you know, there's a storm coming, a giant storm coming. And of course, you know, the phone doesn't work. And, you know, I mean, what could go wrong, really? You know, I, nothing, right? It's going to be, it's all going to go smoothly. <laughs> she's going to finish her book and she's going to go back and it's going to be perfect. So, um, yeah, and it's such a great premise. And I just wondered if you would talk about, I, um, I had read about the sort of the germ or the seed for the story. So I was wondering if maybe you could talk about where that came from and how you wound up, you know, moving into this idea. Yeah, sure. So I think like many of us, but it seems like, especially these days, I've, I've been really just obsessed with true crime. I mean, we've got the true yeah. crime podcasts, uh, documentaries, the true, true crime books. And I found myself just consuming them. Um, as much and as often as I could. And um, I, you know, I have a great admiration for, for true crime writers and how they are able to, um, you know, you know, put onto paper and into media, you know, some things that have happened um, and capture those stories. And, but I'm a fiction writer. So, you know, uh, I'm not, I don't write nonfiction, but I thought I can at least have a crime writer be my protagonist in this book. And I was really excited about that. And um, so the, the character of 
of Wiley was created. And here she is traveling across the country to finish uh, this book of hers. Uh, and she travels to the middle of nowhere, rural Iowa, and um, is met with some things she didn't quite expect. And so that that's really the, the initial idea for the novel. But that came about also with it and the idea of the blizzard, because the blizzard pl plays a big big part in the story as well. Yeah. Um, I was doing what many authors do, just perusing the web, looking for ideas for, for new books. And I came across a story from 1980 about, and it's not a crime story, but it, it was just an interesting um, event that had happened. A, a young woman was driving uh, to a friend's house in Minnesota um, in the middle of winter, you know, blizzard conditions, freezing out icy roads and she slides off the ditch into uh, or slides <laughs> off the road into a ditch and has to decide whether right, right whether or not she stays with the car or walks the two miles to get to her friend's house and she decides to walk and she almost makes it and she collapses outside the, the front steps of the house and isn't discovered for six hours and when uh, her friends find her, uh, she is nearly frozen to death. And um, they get her to the hospital. The, the doctors aren't even able to put hypodermic needles into her because she's so cold, they, they snap. But she survives and she's perfectly fine. And I thought that was just such a harrowing, uh, scary story in itself that I thought, you know, you can't, it's hard to, you know, we battle in our, you know, thriller novels, we battle bad guys and um, terrible circumstances. And, you know, when you throw the weather in there too. It yeah. Out. Yeah. Nature is sort of your ultimate foe, right? It's, right. The, right. it's the thing that you can never, you can never quite win against, never quite win against the weather. Right. Um, yeah. And I think that, that, I mean, that's so often the case, right? Like there's one thing usually, right? Like there's one germ or an idea and it kind of gives you that little zap where you think oh you know that's fascinating like how did that person you know make that decision to drive that car in the storm and then what was that decision like to you know to walk out into the cold and then from there like there's usually um you know a um you know, like an evolution that comes from that idea like the story spin for for uh, you know for people who write the way we write the story kind of spin, spins out from that one seed. Is that kind of how it works for you? Yeah, you know, I, I get this basic idea and uh, start developing the characters. Characters come to mind and uh, start getting to know them on the page. And, yeah. and then, um, you know, I have a path that I typically try to take as I write, but as with more most of my books, uh, they kind of go off in a completely <laughs> different direction. The characters take us places and uh, take right. me places that are yeah. unexpected. Yeah, I am. Um, I'm. I was interested in the. Um, you know, it's also you know, so those like there's the you know the idea and then the way the characters evolve. But in in this particular book, and I have to say, I usually before I do these um, before I do these interviews, I try not to finish the book because I I don't like to know the end before I before I interview because I don't want to give anything away. But I couldn't stop. I couldn't keep myself. <laughs> <laughs> from finishing it so I'm going to just be really super careful because uh, it's very hard to talk about this book without giving away some of the really stunning uh, and exciting twists but I, I think it's safe enough to talk about setting I felt like the setting was so vivid and so present I mean I know that you you're an Iowa native you know so I was wondering was this was the setting like much more present for you in this book than it had been in in other books. And then when you were sort of describing, you know, uh, Josie's upbringing, you know, did that, is that resonant with how you grew up or is it just sort of, you know, osmosis from living there all your life? Like how did, what, what did the setting mean to you in this book? Yeah. You know, most, all my books are set in Iowa in some, you know, fictionalized location, which um, many people yes. can find real life references sure. to. Yeah. Uh, and um, yeah, you know, you th we think of Iowa as this like quintessential, you know, um, safe place for to raise a family, um, 
nothing bad happens, you know, and, and <laughs> furthest from the truth, bad things happen everywhere. And, um, but the setting, you know, it, it's a beautiful uh, farm community. And uh, this young girl has this great family and it's intact. It's, uh, she's got a brother, she's got a best friend, uh, loving parents. And then one event totally blows that all up. She has grandparents just down the lane. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, setting was really important to just kind of set up, uh, you know, what kind of life Josie started with and how quickly that changed uh, yeah. as time went on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it really just felt, and it felt, you know, sort of just incredible. I mean, I know that you, all of your books have been set in Iowa and, um, you know, the setting is always a big feature of all, your, of all of your novels, but you know, th this one felt especially vivid to me. And it, um, it definitely brought to mind for me almost immediately, um, in, in Cold Blood by Truman Capote, which is, you know, probably most people know it's the first, um, the first true crime novel, uh, not novel, but true crime book ever, ever written. And I was wondering, is that something that you read early in your life? Is that something that you kind of care, you know, the essence of it, did you carry a piece of that with you into, into the overnight guest? Yeah. I mean, I think so. I, I you know, I, tend to think that everything I read or we read it, it right. travels with okay. you and it's right. certain that book certainly um, left a, a huge impression on me right. um, and the way that Truman Capote um, makes the setting a character in itself that, you know, the town and yeah. um, we get to know the characters through the landscape as well and um, in my way I attempted to do that um, you know I certainly wouldn't compare myself to the yeah. <laughs> human component, but that was, you know, that was an attempt that I did make. And, um, yeah. and I think also with the setting, um, what, which, what made it so important is that we, we, we enter into it in two different times. So mm -hmm. we've got yes. the true crime case 20 years before set in the, the heat right. of summer, uh, right. you know, Iowa winter or summers are humid and hot and, um, can be unrelenting. Right. And that's where the, the, crime um that Wiley's writing about mm -hmm. when that took place right and then we are there uh, two decades later in the middle of winter which can be just as brutal right uh, in in the midwest and uh so we get these two very different looks at um the setting and it's you know all rooted and literally by this tree that grows up right. out of the, the tree middle, that grows up out of the middle of the road, middle of the right. road, um, yeah. where, um, an intersection, and I, you know, I think that helps uh, ground the Absolutely reader to good. location as well. Yeah. And the fun fact that it, it's a real tree. There's a real tree in Iowa that, uh, for some strange reason, grows up in the middle of uh, between where two roads intersect and. Um, people have to drive around to get there and get where they're going. And um, yeah. it's fun. I like to, to pepper those kinds of locations throughout my books. Yeah. And I found that great that the, you know, like the, um, the, the two investigators that come from out of town, uh, Santos and um, the, her partner, they're just kind of driving along and all of a sudden they're like, whoa, there's, you know, like, <laughs> There's this tree in the row. You don't see that every day. Right. And, you know, it just kind of felt like, you know, one of those moments where you see, you see the, the area and the town from the perspective of somebody who's a little bit outside right. and that gave, that gave, gave a really super interesting, um, uh, perspective as well. And it's interesting, like the, the whole, um, you know, the, the character, I I've had a number of characters in my books that are writers and I always enjoy writing about writers because, you know, they're a little bit nuts and they, you know, <laughs> you know, they have these like vivid imaginations and they, they're driven by things that, you know, I think, you know, other people are not, are not driven by like a writer could be, you know, really driven by just like wanting to figure something out. Right. And like, that makes a lot, that makes a lot of sense to me. And so the true crime, the true crime writer perspective of, of Wiley, I thought it was a really, um, you know, it was really fun and, and interesting. And it made me kind of think about on a, on a larger scale, you know, um, like Lee Child is really gives a talk about, you know, about thrillers, right. And he talks about how, um, you thrill, he feels like the first story ever told was a thriller, 
you know, and that the, and, and the, the, they're the stories that we tell ourselves around the campfire, you know, it's like how the hunter fell the beast and, and, you know, and fed the village for the, for the winter or how the hero conquered, you know, the, 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 the bad force working against the people or whatever it is. And we tell ourselves these stories because um, we want to be braver in the dark, you know, and I feel like that's why people turn to uh, crime fiction, you know, because this, there's this very discernible, you know, beginning, middle, and end, and justice is served. I also think it's why people, especially right now, are so fascinated by true crime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. I agree. I think we, you know, we're, we're looking for answers. We're looking for justice. We want to think that things like this can't happen to us. We exactly. Do everything right. We lock our doors. We right. Um, carry mace, you know, whatever. And we think that something bad just couldn't possibly happen. Right. Uh, yeah. And I think that, um, why do you think that, so without giving anything away, why mm -hmm. do you think that, um, you know, why do you think Wiley, we know that, you know, she come, she's, she's in a kind of a dark place when we first meet her, you know, she's sort of she's essentially run away from her challenges with her family. She's got a difficult teenage son and she's, you know, kind of over it and she needs to finish her book and she's, but you can kind of see that she's not in a great place, right? Like you don't right. know too much about her and her history, but you know, why do you think that um, she turned to, um, I was going to say organized crime, but that's not what I meant. <laughs> book. Why do you think she turned to crime? Why do you think she turned to true, <laughs> yeah. to, um, to true, to true crime writing? Why do you think she, why do you think she comes to that? Yeah. And I, I think, um, you know, Wiley writes to like many of us do to find out what's going to happen next to, yeah. you know, finish maybe some unfinished business and, um, to find some closure in, in situations that often don't feel like they have any. And, right. um, you know, in the book, I think it mentions she, um, she wants to, to be able to give some voices to some, to the victims, right. and their families that they, you know, that they are able to, um, literally close the, the, the chapter on, on that time in their lives. And, mm -hmm. um, so I think, uh, that is her motivation. I think she also uses it as an escape of her own life. As you mentioned, um, when we first yeah. meet Wiley, she's kind of prickly. Um, yeah. we, we don't know what she's about or, you know, we get some little snippets into her life. She, she's got an ex-husband and a son who she's not in a great place with. Right. So she hits the road and, um, under the guise that she needs to finish this book and right. yes, she does, but, um, does she need to come all the way across the country to do it? That's debatable. And, and right. then there she, you know, she, um, does her best to not get involved with the locals. She's got this stray dog that adopts her that she really wants nothing to do with but uh, <laughs> he won't leave her alone and she <laughs> finds herself that no matter how far she tries to run um you know things come to her and yes. she's got to yeah. deal with it she's got to yeah. deal with it. and I think that that's like such a, I mean that's so true right like you know there are just certain things that you you just can't run away from those things. You know, they're, they're going to, they're going to catch up with you one way or another. And I think we definitely saw that unfold for, um, for, for Wiley. Mm -hmm. Um, we, um, I have a ton of really great questions from people who wrote in, um, when they, when they signed up. So I might, you, I might go to some of those now, um, while we still have, uh, time to, to dive into it. Um, some of them you've kind of, we've already kind of hit on, but one question I thought was really great. And this is from Abina Duncan. Hi, Abina. If you're there, thanks for writing in. Um, it is okay. I just lost it. What is it? There it is. Uh, what was the hardest scene to write in the overnight guest and why? I think I know what it was. Oh gosh. Um, yeah. there are lots of there were a lot of tough scenes in, in yeah. this, in this book. And I think, um, I think I can say without giving too much away that probably the crime scene 
when um at the you yeah. know near the that that drives the entire book it's, it's the yeah. you know the crime scene um yeah and um how difficult it is for the family members and um it just is it's heart-wrenching and sad and it was a difficult thing to write um you know if you talk to anybody in my family I just had this conversation with my sisters I'm the one who gets weak need um when anything right. um a little bit right, when you're watching it right yeah yeah <laughs> but, and yeah. I'm the one who that you know may not be the best in an emergency <laughs> and <laughs> um but I can I can sit down and write it and uh, it's different for me but it was challenging I mean there are times when I feel like I need to step away from my desk and, and my computer to to do yeah. that I mean it does get kind of heavy it can you know yeah. you and sometimes you that darkness settles on you and you don't even realize it until right. you've sort of walked back walked away from that the brain that you used to write which is different from the brain that you used to live or at least that's true in my case very true yeah um but and then you don't you, you feel like just this kind of mental heaviness and you're like okay i need to you know go do something like shake that off or whatever right. Um, I, I had, yeah, there were a couple of scenes that were really difficult for me. The one of it was the, uh, the, um, I'm not going to give anything away by talking about the fried chicken. Oh the yeah. Chicken. That, yeah, yeah. Um, in the, in the third, in, in the third, person. that was really hard. And then the moment where, um, Josie had to make that really difficult choice in the, in the true crime narrative. Right. And she let go of her, her friend's hand. And that was right. really hard. So yeah, there, those are things that, you know, kind of not, no, but nobody asked me what was hardest for me to read, but that. <laughs> well, I was curious. <laughs> I'm curious. Yeah. <laughs> that's my answer to, yeah. <laughs> to that question. So there, <laughs> I'm just putting it out there. Um, let me look at some of the other questions. And there's also um, there. Oh my gosh, there's a chat and there's a Q and A. Let's see what's there. Um, let's see what we have. Um, yeah, that's an inter that's an interesting question from from Joseph. Like, okay, so in terms of the, you know, you have these three very distinct um timelines and I, I often do this myself I often have different perspectives and, and different timelines and for me it's never um you know things evolve you know that way for me on the page and I've heard that other people um other uh writers tend to write each individual piece separately and then merge them together. So how did you manage your, how, how did you manage your three timelines? Yeah, you know, I, I knew I wanted to do the three perspectives and um, I decided to start with the true crime that, that, that happened the 20 years before. Uh, mm -hmm. First, because I felt like I needed to get a handle on that, um, that whole situation, the scene, the circumstances surrounding that crime before I could, really delve into the present day, which is, which are the blizzard scenes. And um, so I started with that and I wrote and um, it happened to be in um, summertime, Iowa. So that was perfect to, you know, um, with that, that, the hot August sun and um, yeah. you know, the, so that was the best atmosphere for that. But I, I wrote as far as I could, but then I knew I needed to pick up the, the thread um, for the winter scenes the, the 20 years later. And so right. um, I started those and with it. And so, and then, then I went back and forth, then I went back and mm -hmm. forth. I wasn't able to write anything all the way through. And right. um, the third perspective, which um, I don't say a whole lot about, but it, I really, it's the mother and daughter scenes. And um, yeah. that really didn't come together. It did not come together the way um, I wanted it to, and, uh, you know, and talking with my wonderful editor, our wonderful editor. Um, hi, Erica. Hi, I know she's Erica. listening. <laughs> and um, I needed to rethink that. And so that came yeah. much, much later in the process. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, I think really uh, pulled the, the two um, other timelines together and then brought the stories together. And yeah. So it didn't, it wasn't, you know, planned out that way. It, it, you know, it revolves like many of my stories do 
in the, right. the course of the project. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, mine as well. I think we, we've talked about this on some of our author talks, chats that we do with Mary Kabika and JT Ellison. And we talked about the difference between, you know, the plotter and some people call it the panther, mm -hmm. but I don't like that because it kind of feels like, oh, just you accidentally happen to write in a novel, like by the seat of your pants, which is, you know, definitely, definitely not the case. Right. It's just a different way of doing it. We've started calling it the difference between plotters and gardeners. Oh, you know, it's almost yeah, like yeah, the seed yeah. get, and I can't take credit for it because I think it's a George R. R. Martin thing, mm -hmm. but like the seed gets planted and then the story starts to grow and then you tend to what's growing, you know, yeah. you, you water it and give it light and, and air and, you know, edit it or prune it or whatever, you know, and kind of allow it to to grow from the space that came from yeah. to, to panther yeah I yeah. like that much better yeah I I would say that I'm more of a gardener in that sense that yeah. you know, I whenever I try to plot out my my books it never quite works yeah. never it quite does. works I know I've tried to do it too it's just yeah. like it's almost like it's not there until you're writing it you yeah know, it's just not there you can think about it all you want you can feel that next for me in the process, like I can feel that next tug, right? To the next thing, like I could, I'll hear it or I'll see it, right? And and I can go there then, but until then, like, it's just not there. It's not, you couldn't create, for, I couldn't personally create it in an outline, I don't think. I know. I'm sure I, it would be for easier for to do sure. that. Maybe. Yeah, no, and no, and it, you know, maybe, I, no, maybe I, not. Maybe it's yeah. not. <laughs> I say I'm not, I'm definitely not the most efficient writer, but you know, it, yeah. it comes eventually and yeah. you know, the story begins to take shape. Yeah. I'm not sure efficiency is what we're going for. That's true. Right? That's true. Yes. <laughs> yes, for sure. Um, so speaking of just sort of, you know, this type of process, do you have a, do you have a routine? Do you have a writing routine? I know people always love to hear about that. Like, do you have you know, do you write early? Do you write late? Like what's your, what's your happy writing routine? Yeah. You know, it really depends on what part of the process I'm in. Um, when I'm really into the deep, the, the, you know, really deep into a novel, like I am now finishing up my next one. Um, you know, I spend lots of hours behind the, yeah. my laptop and, um, you know, I have Lolo nearby. I have my dog Lolo's nearby. I have, you know, my water. I have lots of times at this point in the, the process, I have chocolate nearby and, oh, yeah. um, <laughs> and I, you know, I just really work away to spend and it can be composing. It can be revising. It can be, um, going back mm -hmm. and rereading, um, every day can mm -hmm. be quite different. It just depends on what, yeah. what part of the process, um, I'm in. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of like, you know, it starts like sort of on a, like a, it starts slower and then gets more intense as you get closer to Absolutely. the end kind of thing. Yeah. 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 Um, I am going to try to get to some of these other questions and uh, see where we're at. Okay, great. We have plenty of time. Um, so Marsha Brugink wants to know, I hope I pronounced that well. Um, what do you do if you have writer's block? Yeah, uh, well, I do a couple different things. Um, number one for me is just to remove myself from my situation behind the computer yeah. and getting yeah, out. Yeah, that's the first thing is you got to yeah. go do something physical, right? right? Yeah. Right. So I, I go walking, to, we, Lolo and I go hiking, um, mm -hmm. get out. And um, so many times that really can jog things and, and loosen things up. And I'm able to work through uh, whatever the issue is, whether it's, you know, I don't know where to go next or um, something's just not feeling right to me on the page. Um, moving really works for me. And something I discovered recently, um, because I didn't know how to do it until this winter, uh, this fall is, um, I started swimming, I started swimming last. Ah, and nice. I learned, well, yeah. swim, you know, my adulthood here than the last year. And boy, I found that really is a very meditative way to um, think about the books. And yeah, um, yeah really been really been a neat thing to to 
kind of clear things up. Another thing I do um, is when I get stuck, sometimes walking, again, walking away from the computer and putting things in longhand. Um, there's something about oh, yeah. putting yeah, um, pen to paper and going back to my journals and notebooks, um, you know, particularly tricky scenes or um, if I need to brainstorm, that makes a big difference for me. And I don't know if it's part of the brain, you know, um, work, but it um, really makes a difference. Hi, Lolo. <laughs> Hi, Lolo. <laughs> yeah, I, I find myself writing longhand a lot. Like there are some books that are, you know, um, just written longhand, you know, mm -hmm. and then it starts there. And then I, you know, sort of put it into the computer and that like sort of becomes like the first editorial phase of the book when you start sort of retyping what you wrote yeah. and some books just want just want that and they don't um you know they don't want to be written any any other way and some right. books are want to be written on the laptop and some some books i'd have to be at my desk yeah so it's just a kind of it, it kind of dictates how it wants to be told in a weird yeah. way i agree yeah um jessica dellinger wants to know what is the best advice you have ever received? I assume that this is about writing, but maybe, who knows, maybe it's just the best advice you ever received about anything, so. Oh, well, <laughs> um, I've received lots of advice. I get a lot, I, I'm the youngest of six. So I get lots of advice oh. from <laughs> my family and wonderful and from my husband and my kid, I mean, everybody. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know if I could pick one, one thing from that. Um, but I think the best advice I ever got um, for writing, and it seems so basic and easy, but it's one that I have to remind myself all the time, you know, it's write the book you want to read, you know, and um, yeah, you know, if I'm invested in the book and in the story and I want to find out what happens next, um, mm -hmm. you know, that's a good thing. And that, you know, that we work on books for such a long time you know so many months yeah. is, you know it's yeah. beyond and um if I'm so invested in the characters and in the story and want to find out what happens next myself um that's always better so that's been really good advice for me and also yeah. um you know to read just read as you know wide far and deep as much as I can and yeah. um read anything so that's yeah. Do you find that it's kind of like, I mean, I find for myself that it's kind of a continuum, you know, writing, reading and research that it all just kind of one inspires the other inspires the other, you know, like you're researching something and it inspires something in your novel and then your novel makes you research something and then you wind up <laughs> read, reading something, you know, and it's all kind of it just is, a nonstop, yeah. you know, movement right through life, I guess. Yeah, I agree. It's it just, fine. yeah, one thing leads to the next, to the next. And um, before we know it, we have another idea to write about and then the cycle yeah. starts all over again. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, let's see on the Q&A. Um, Sharon per Person um, asks, where did you come up with the name of the town? Mm. Okay. Yeah. So the town name is Burden in the Overnight yeah. Guest. And that in itself has, you know, very strong connotations yeah. uh, of a town being, you know, burdensome. I, you know, the, yeah. it's, so it's made up. Um, but also, you know, I think I explained in the book that it was named after somebody as well, but it, it has that double meaning of, you know, this town yeah. and its inhabitants are carrying with it this burden of what happened in the, you know, this town yeah. 20 years before and um, the community carries it, the, the family of the victims, um, the you know law enforcement in the community carries it as well and um it just seemed like such a fitting name uh for where the story yeah it was it was perfect and it, it totally felt like it did not feel made up at all like it totally felt like the, na the name of the town like i just assumed that it was a real place yeah yeah everything it, uh, through all these things. yeah it was such a such a perfect name for it yeah yeah it worked out it worked out great it, it seemed to fit it quite well um yeah it it was it was just one of the many wonderful things about <laughs> about the book 
Um, we kind of touched on this a little bit, but um, Carla DeWald um, wrote an interesting question. She said, what do you love most about the world of mystery and suspense and darkness? Yeah, you know, um, I get that question a lot because, you know, pe people will say, you know, you seem like, I think for all of us, we seem so seem happy, so nice. We seem so nice yeah. you write about these things. And, um, you know, I often think of it as, you know, I grew up in a, a home where, you know, I could read what I wanted. I could, you know, I, mm -hmm. my creativity was encouraged and yes. applauded. And so I felt like I could, you know, I can explore and, and one of, you know, really fun thing, you know, I used, back in the day when we used to have three channels, like ABC yeah. and CBS, uh, those yeah. were our choices, may, uh, maybe PBS. Um, and Friday nights, I'd sit and watch some, you know, the Friday night mystery with my dad. Yeah. And yeah, sure. um, that was such, you know, always such a special time for us. And then that grew into, you know, sharing books and, um, and many of which mm -hmm. were, were thrillers and mysteries. So yeah. it's just, yeah. um, I love like many um, as a reader, being able to be immersed in a mystery, a thriller, and see if I can solve it as I um, follow the clues. Yeah. Yeah. I always feel like I, you know, like I always feel like I didn't, you know, I didn't choose to write um, crime fiction any more than I cho chose to be a writer in the first place. You know, I feel like I've always had just this like really super dark and twisted imagination, you know, and I, I feel like in a lot of ways, you know, like when you're a kid or especially when you're a young girl and you have questions, right. About, you know, dark things, it's not a conversation that most people want to have right. with you. Right. And so you find yourself asking those questions of like, I don't know, Stephen King or, <laughs> Right. Or BC Andrews, Andrews has been much say. discussed lately. Yeah, that, that has been a big <laughs> or, discussion. Or yeah, or right. <laughs> you find yourself asking questions that looks like that and you get answers that may or may not be, you know, may or may not be accurate or may not may not be appropriate for your age. But I feel like I went, you know, I had all these sort of dark ideas and I just wanted somebody to explain some stuff to me. And I feel like that's kind of why I you know, turn to that. And I think it's why people still, you know, turn, like we were saying earlier, still turn to, you know, po you know, crime podcasts. Like they want right. to, you know, hear how people, you know, these terrible things happen and they want to dive into how and why. And maybe part of it is, you know, I, I want to make sure I'm not one of these people that's doing this thing. So, you know, like, so it doesn't happen to me, but I think maybe a deeper part of it is that we're just trying to understand human nature. We're trying to understand right. ourselves and, understand right. the dark forces that we perceive right and um yeah just trying to work through you know how people can be so cruel and unkind and right. um and you know with the search for justice i think is a big part yeah. of that yes i think so because you know we all know that justice is not always served and right. so i think we're always kind of and as americans especially i think we're uniquely like sort of hardwired to believe that right. you know evil never triumphs and right. you know the, you know and it's, it's going to be that one tiny thing that like solves the crime and oh. he's not going to get away with it and all that so we're always kind of looking for that narrative i think to um you know to keep us uh you know living the dream right <laughs> the dream everything's the, going to be okay <laughs> <laughs> the dream of justice is going to be okay. It's a, the, right, you know, good right. is always going to triumph always. Right. So yeah, that's definitely something we're all looking for. I think, um, let's see, we have so many really good questions here. Um, let's see. Oh, so yeah, we talked a little bit about your process and how long, you know, and how, and how you go about writing, how long does it take for you um, this is from Aaron Miles. How long did it take you to write the overnight guests and how long does it typically take you to, um, to, to write a novel? Yeah. Um, for me, I guess, you know, it varies with each project again, but for the overnight guest, I, I was thinking about this. Um, I, by the time I started, I, you know, was kicking around the idea and, um, it took about a year to write the first draft. 
-hmm. and then um, maybe then some really deep revision um, after that. So for me, it typically takes a year to 15 to 18 months to from beginning to end um, to, to go, yeah. write a book, I would say. Um, and I always describe my writing as I write ugly. I um, just get everything out on the page. Uh, the, yeah, the good, the bad, the ugly, it all gets out there. And then, um, and then the, the real work really comes in the revision process where to mine, looking for the, the, you know, the pieces to keep, the, the items that you know, end up on the cutting room floor, things to change. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, and I think that that's an interesting part of it too, is that like, you know, it probably, you, know, you write that first draft and then there's a whole, I mean, there's really a whole other year after that first of not just writing and, um, you know, and, and doing multiple drafts that you do on your own, but then there's a the very collaborative process, you know, with our editor, Erica. Hi, Erica. Okay. We love you. <laughs> and there's another year of... of they love you a lot. Um, yeah. And like doing the, the content editing. And then of course there's all the, the copy editing and the proofreading drafts and all of those things. So it's really, it really is more of a, a two-year process. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, Jack Jack is protesting. He's like whining because he's not the center of attention and yet he won't come over to be the center of attention. <laughs> well, so hi Jack Jack. <laughs> We can't come on, Baba. You don't you can't want to rap. see Let's, you. Come on over. I know everybody wants to see you, but he's like withholding himself for some reason. I don't <laughs> he know. knows. And he just got he just got groomed yesterday, so he oh, looks really beautiful. handsome. Yeah, but I don't know. I can't. Well, you know, you can. That's okay. You can lead a dog to water, yes. but you can't <laughs> lead him to the, <laughs> the camera <laughs> <Yeah>. and. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so Rachel Bataglia asks, um, who is your favorite character that you have created in oh any God. of your books? I know that's such a hard question, that but is, I thought I'd throw it out. Yeah, that is such a hard question. Um, you know, I think there are some very special ones in each book. Um, Wiley's pretty special. I think we kind of see yeah. her transformation throughout the book. Um, so I really liked writing her. Um, uh, you know, I really loved writing Amelia from Not a Sound um, a few yeah. books ago. Yeah. Amelia is a very character. unique yeah. character. Um, yeah. Really loved writing her. Um, you know, and I have a lot of um, child characters in my books. I write, you know, from multiple perspectives and often there's yeah. a child perspective. And I always think that's really an interesting, um, you know, fun process to include, you know, a younger voice in, in the books as well. So I always enjoy yeah. that. Yeah. 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 And it's so hard. I mean, do you have anybody that like kind of stays, do you have anybody that kind of stays with you that yeah. you like think that comes back up and you're like, okay, I'm going to, this person need like, you know, needs a book or mm -hmm. needs another, needs another sort of appearance. Yeah. I always and, like, do you have any of that? Yeah. I, I mean, I love reading series. I, I absolutely adore yeah. reading um, mystery series and thriller series. And so I'm always thinking, you know, is there another story to be told with the character? So Amelia, you know, I think about her a lot. Um, I think, um, you know, Callie from The Way to Silence, my first book that the young character yeah. would be um, a young adult now. And would it be interesting to go back and revisit her and her story? Yeah. I think that would yeah, be really yeah. interesting um, yeah. to do. Um, but I think, you know, I guess I haven't landed on um, a story or somewhere to take my, the characters I've written about in a new direction. But I think, you know, the closest to writing a series, I think would be my settings is, you know, my settings are typically mm -hmm. all in, um, you know, this fictional world of, of Iowa and these ordinary yeah. people put in unique situations. And that is one thing yeah. that's carried from book to book. I think the different yeah. Iowa settings. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna move on to my uh, my speed round now, yes. which I always love to. All right here we go. <laughs> I love to do. Here we go. Okay, Mac or PC? Mac. Red or white? White. White. Coffee or tea? Tea. Tea. Okay. Um, your first 
fictional love. Okay, so this is a little tougher because um, <laughs> that could be taken very many different ways. I gotta say, yeah. I have to say, um, the first book I absolutely not the first, but the book that absolutely blew my mind, and it was as a young adult, was My Antonia by Willa Cather. Mm, and okay. I just fell in love with her writing and the story. And I revisit that book all the time. I, every time I go to a new bookstore, I look for it, uh, an edition yeah. of it. And so I've yeah. got many sitting on my yeah. bookshelf. And yeah. I just love the way she um, writes about setting. Honestly, she just creates yeah. the character. The setting is this huge character in her books. And yeah just adore, adore that book. So I think that that is like my big love. Okay. That's transcended time and place. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. I, I guess I feel, I feel that way about Truman Capote. You know, oh yeah. I, that was where I fell in love with language, you know, in his, in his books, like chame, um, music for chameleons and other voices, other rooms, which are some fictional and some non-fictional vignettes. And I really, kind of, you know, I look for those books every, everywhere I go and revisit yeah. them all the time, you know, and in cold blood, of course, but that was, that was later in life when I watched, when I read that. Yes. Um, Reacher or Born? Reacher. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, you know, um, Kyle's books, you know, <laughs> one of the, the, the series that my dad and I bond over. We just both really yeah. love that. And that was, it's been so much fun too. Yeah chat with him about it yeah perfect. yeah um netflix and chill or party all night i think i know the answer to that. <laughs> you have to ask netflix and chill <laughs> i had to ask yes um okay we already did platter versus gar platter or gardener so we decided gardener. that you're a gardener yes. and what is the last show that you watched that you absolutely loved Okay, so um, I'm not going to count count Reacher because I'm still watching that. Okay, um, right, me too. Yeah, but I love it. It's so good. I got to say, I am love. I loved um, the woman across the street from the woman in the window. Oh, I'm <laughs> in the middle of it right now. It is just so delightfully fun <laughs> and such a fun take it, it on is. thriller, you know, thriller <laughs> books and thriller movies and... I'm just enjoying everything. Yeah, it movie. really is. Yeah. And I loved murders. Yeah, I mean, only... at first I was kind of like, I don't... go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, um, and then, you know, only murders in the building is another one. Just, I oh, love yeah. as well. And oh, the, the oh, new. People are chiming in here. Yellow jackets. Did you see, yeah. did you see yellow jackets? I, I started that, um, but then other things came up, but yeah, I've heard yeah. nothing but great things. Yeah, uh, pretty, and the, pretty, the pretty Dexter, I had to watch the the Dexter. Oh yeah, I haven't too, watched so it that. Yet. I enjoyed that as well. Yeah. yeah, I'm definitely going back to that too. And then um, this was also a question. Um, this was a question for both of us. Um, also from um, uh, the one of the readers who are um, who's here with us today, and uh, she wants to know what's next on your TBR list. Okay. Yeah. So I, you know, I always have a huge stack. So I, um, I do have, I just picked this one up. I'm getting all the buzz, um, the made by Anita Pro. Oh yeah. So oh, yeah I'm dying to that. heard nothing but excellent things about that. So excited. Yeah. And also I don't have it right in front of me, but, um, Kelly Garrett has a new one coming out called Like a Sister. I've got that um, all ready to read and um, get a sneak peek into that. So I'm very excited to read read her newest as well. How about you? I have, um, I just got this in the mail. Um, the Other Family by Wendy Corsi Staub. I love Wendy. She's such a tremendous writer and um, I am just ready to, I'm going to dive into this next. And I just finished uh, Her Last Affair by John Searles, who's also going to be joining me down in Florida for a live event, which is very exciting. Um, but yeah, another excellent book, Her Her Last Affair by John Searles, really, 
really uh, smart and he's such a beautiful writer and, you know, just kind of walks the line between a lot of different types of, uh, of stories. And I just really, I really love everything he writes is different. And I love, I always love everything he writes. So fabulous. Yes. Yeah. So, and then I also find me by Al Fair Burke um, mm-hmm. is something that uh, she's also coming down to Florida to hang out oh. with me. Yay. And um, she's a great friend and also one of my favorite writers and, and her new book is is really gripping as well so those are the most recent those are the most recent books yeah Yeah. greatest yeah well speaking of books i just wanted to remind everybody that if you want to buy a copy of the overnight guest by the amazing heather goodenkoff that you can do so on bn.com or of course at any of your local barnes and noble stores um, you, if you, ha- I tried to keep everything really spoiler free. I hope I was successful at that because I know not everybody here has read, um, but I'm sure now you're all going to have to race out and get your copy or race online and get your copy because you definitely do not want to miss this, um, fantastic book. Well, thank you so much, Lisa. I'm so thrilled that you could be here with me and, um, it's just been so much fun to chat with you like it always is. So thank yeah. you and to everybody who joined us today. Yeah, and I next time we do this, I would like to do it in person and I would like there to be a cocktail involved. Oh, yes. Yeah, so we fun. could still broadcast it. We could still broadcast it out. But we, <laughs> we could be together. Like little, but we could be together. We could have yeah. a cocktail and then do like an Instagram live or something like that. And we could just like, you know, um, have a... Um, you know, have a little party. Like I'm yeah. looking forward to some more, hopefully seeing some more in-person chats. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Um, big thanks to Barnes and Noble and thanks to everybody for being here uh, today with us. It's been a real pleasure um, to talk to you and I tried to get to as many questions as I could. Uh, so I hope um, if you don't, you know, I'm sure if you still have questions, you could probably find Heather you know, pretty much everywhere, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, you can ask her your questions and I'm sure she'll be happy to answer them um, anywhere. Yes. Right. Thank you, Heather. Thank you.